So welcome to this video about deriving the L1 Lagrange point. So just a quick recap on what the Lagrange points are. So in the two body problem, you've got five locations where an object with negligible mass can be placed where the gravitational forces of the two larger objects are going to match the centrifugal force required to orbit for the same period as two. So the L1, L2, L3 points are typically not stable, so it means that if they move off that particular point or location, they quite quickly move away, so they're not particularly stable. The L1 has to orbit slower than it would do normally, so the planet has to kind of slow it down. And a object at L2 needs to speed up so that it orbits with the same velocity as the planet. Now, the one we're interested in here is the L1, but the it's basically the same as L2, it's just on the opposite side, so it's going to have a similar value anyway. And they're all in a line between the two larger objects. So you've got the M1, which will be our Sun, and M2, which is Jupiter. So we'll use the Sun and Jupiter in our derivation here. The L4 and L5 are stable, so these sit about 60 degrees in front and behind on the orbit, and they appear to orbit these imaginary points on the orbit but we're not interested in those for this particular video so let's reduce it down to one dimensions so you've got m1 and then you've got m2 and the distance that separates them is this distance called r now the l1 and l2 lagrange points are located at some distance of r we call it uppercase R from M2. So we can write the L1 and L2 locations down here at the bottom, which is basically just the R minus R, R plus R. So we already know from the definition of these Lagrange points that the gravitational forces and the centrifugal forces have got to equal when an object's on a circular orbit. So we've got the equation for gravitational force, which is your FG on the upper left, and then you've got your centrifugal force on the upper right. And since we know they must equal when it's on a circular orbit, we can equate them, which we've got at the bottom there. Now we can start to tidy that up a little bit and put it in terms that we'll need later on. So if we multiply by R and then divide by M2, then what we actually get is this equation at the bottom in terms of velocity squared. So we've got velocity squared equals g m1 over r. And that's important for when we get a bit later down the line. Now, we can also find a term for the orbital period. Well, we know what the orbital period would be if we know its orbital velocity and the circumference of the orbit. So we know the distance separating the two, which is r. Yeah, sure. Um, radius of your orbit. So we can work out the circumference of the orbit, we know the orbital velocity, so we can introduce this new term in there which is the orbital period t. So if we then divide this new equation that we've got by t, we have it in terms of velocity, so we've got v equals 2 pi r over t, and then if we square it we've then got a new equation for velocity squared which we can then use in relation to what we had before. So we've got two equations now for the velocity squared, and we can then substitute them basically, or we can equal them to one another. So then we've now removed V from our equation. So if we then divide that by R squared, we can actually remove the R from the right-hand side of the equation. And then we've just basically got the orbital period on the right hand side. Now, if we're going to place an object, so this new object M3 is a small negligible mass and it's in between M1 and M2. Now, we want it to be at the L1 Lagrange point, which is what we're going to find. But if it's in between the two, then it's receiving a gravitational force from both objects from M1 and M2. So we can then write its total gravitational force at the bottom here, where the first part is due to M1 and the second part is due to M2.
So we know again that if it's on a circular orbit, then your gravitational forces and your centrifugal forces must equal. So now we've just written it for M3. So instead of just having R as your distance separating the two, we know that it's actually going to be R minus the distance is away from Jupiter or that smaller secondary mass. So that's what we've written here. Now we can then tidy that up again. So if we divide by this R minus R in the brackets, uh, or multiply, we can then get it in terms of the velocity squared for M3 on the right hand side. So then we've only got the velocity on that side. And we, we know from some previous equations that we had velocity squared equal to some equation, which we can use later on. So at the L1 Lagrange point, the orbital period must match M2 because they stay where they are. So an object located at L1 or even L2 has got to have the same orbital period as M2 itself. So we can then write this orbital period of M3 equals the orbital period of M2. So assuming the equation from before, so we had this velocity squared equation which had the orbital period and the distance separating on the right hand side. So we can then write that in terms of the velocity for M3. So this time around, we just use the orbital period of M3 and the distance separating the two, which is your R minus R. And then if we divide through by this R minus R squared, then what we actually do is we just end up with a orbital period or t on the right hand side which is obviously divide, dividing the 4 pi squared but we know that the orbital periods of m2 and m3 are the same and we had an equation before where we had this gm1 over r cubed equals 4 pi squared over the orbital period squared and that was in terms of m2 so actually we can go and use that in our previous equation so now we substitute that in and we no longer have the orbital period in any part of our equation it's now in terms of the mass and the distances separating them so now what you want to do is divide through by gm1 and what that will do is it will just leave this one over r cubed on the right hand side. So we no longer have g in the equation and we've only got m2 and m1 occurring once as well. So now to actually remove those masses from the equation, we can just use a ratio of them instead. So we're going to introduce this new term a, which is m2 over m1. So we just substitute that into the bottom equation there. And we no longer have the masses appear. We just have this A instead and just makes it a bit easier to work with. Now, if we then multiply by R cubed, we end up with one on the right hand side. So that makes it a bit easier as well. So now we're just left with this, these two distances. So in the same manner as what we got rid of the masses with, we can get rid of those distances and just use the ratio of it instead. So we now have this new term B, which we can then introduce. And we then have this bottom equation, which only has an A and a B in it, which makes it a bit easier to work with. Now, we know that B is going to be very small. So the distance separating the two larger masses is considerably larger than the distance of these Lagrange points away from M2. So B is going to be very small. So we can make some approximations. So you can use the binomial theorem to approximate this one over one minus B cubed. So we can just approximate it to one plus three B. I'm not gonna go into detail as to how you do that. You can have a, a check on how you do that, but it's one of the, it's basically what you get as an approximation from this particular theorem. And we can do something similar to the other part. So here you're, bit, you're dividing by this one minus B and you can approximate it as being the same as multiplying by one plus B because B is going to be very small. It's gonna have a very little effect on the total 
outcome. So we can actually, instead of dividing it by 1 minus b, we can multiply it by 1 plus b, and the answer will be reasonably similar, so we can approximate that. Now, if we then introduce those two approximations into our main equation, then we can get a bit of a simpler one at the bottom. So your 3b is going to be approximately equal to your right-hand side there. Now, if we multiply by b squared, we actually get this 3b cubed is approximately equal to a times 1 plus b in the brackets. This is getting a bit easier to understand now. But again, this b is going to be very, very small and is going to make very little difference. So we can actually neglect that. We can remove it because it makes very little difference to the overall answer we're going to get. So we can then just rewrite it as 3b cubed is approximately equal to a. Now, if we go back and remember what your a and b's were, so your a was the mass of the second object divided by the mass of the primary or the larger object. So for the example of the Sun and Jupiter, we can actually work out a value for A. And this gives us a value of about 9.54 times 10 to the minus 4. So it's a fairly small number as well as, I mean, as B would be quite small as well. So once we put that in, and we work out a value for b, we work out that it's about 0 0.06. Now, if we go back to the, <clears throat> the real system, that means that L1 is located about 6% of the distance between the Sun and the Jupiter from the surface or from Jupiter. So it's located quite close to Jupiter. L2 would be basically the same, just on the opposite side. And the other interesting thing, really, is that it lies at approximately where the hill radius is. So the hill radius is the sphere of influence of the second object. So this is where the gravitational influence of that secondary object finishes, and then it would be dominated by the larger object if it was outside that. So it makes sense that the L1 and L2 Lagrange points sit kind of at the boundary of that. So if you put in the actual values for the A and B in terms of this the distances and the masses, you'll come to a similar sort of figure as the Hill radius. So that is how we actually derive the L1 Lagrange point. And actually, you can still get the distance for L2, but it's on the opposite side. It's kind of in the same way as we would do it. We just treat it on the opposite side this time around, and you'd get a similar answer. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoy, then you can check out some of the other videos.